We're talking today with Robert Buys of Alto, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Bob, start with some background on yourself, and you've got a family with some military history, so we're going to talk about that too. So, uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in uh, May of 1951 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. All right, uh, and what were your parents doing at that time? Well, my father was uh, in the Marine Corps Reserves in Grand Rapids, and uh, he was activated uh, during the Korean War, uh, and so uh, he was uh, sent to Korea after the Chosen Reservoir, and they lost so many Marines, and uh, so he was in Korea, and mom found herself pregnant back home, and uh, she was pregnant with twins, I'm an identical twin. All right. And now, did he know that she was pregnant before he left? No, he did not. And he knew that she was pregnant from letters that she had written him, but he didn't know she was pregnant with twins. Mm -hmm. And uh, a telegram came to my dad's field office while he was in Korea stating that my mother had twins. And uh, the word got around in the unit that there was a telegram, and my father didn't believe it until he actually read the telegram. And mom had written a letter stating she was going to have twins, but uh, mail was pretty slow back then, especially in a war zone. And uh, he got the letter a few days after the telegram came. And so that really confirmed things. Okay. Now, what was his job in Korea? He was in the motor pool. He worked on bulldozers and uh, trucks and jeeps, and, uh, but also carried a gun because when they, they would come into uh, a, a hostile area, he had to be able to defend himself. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, these days, uh, if there's a family emergency or something like that, we can bring servicemen back home from pretty much anywhere for a leave or a visit or anything, or bring them back early. Was anything like that done for your father? Well, matter of fact, it was. Uh, mother was struggling raising twins at her mother's house and said, boy, it sure would be nice if dad could come home early from Korea. And my grandmother, Nellie Mulder, used to babysit and do house cleaning for the Ford family in Ada. And so she knew Jerry Ford, and of course Jerry Ford was a congressman back then. So she wrote a handwritten letter to Jerry, and he responded and said he thought he could help her. And sure enough, he pulled some strings, made some phone calls, and got Dad to come home early from Korea. Mm -hmm. He came home after my brother and I were six months old. That's the first time he'd seen us. All right, uh, and then you've got some other relatives with a military background. Yes, yeah, going back, I'm actually fourth generation military. My grandfather uh, fought in World War I in the Army. He grew up on the family farm, again in Ada. Didn't like farming, ran away from home when he was 16, joined the Army, and was in World War I in a howitzer division. And uh, he survived World War I, came back home, and uh, went to work for the CNO Railroad. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you've got, I think, what, another, an uncle? Yes, or? a great uncle who I had heard stories about. His name was James Swartz. Uh, he enlisted in the Army Air Corps in 1939. And, of course, then World War II started. Uh, he became very active as a pilot, flying a P-40 and wasn't one of the greatest planes, but it was something they used back then. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, flying in the Philippines and shot down by the Japanese and became a prisoner of war. And uh, he was forced, this was in early of 1942, and he was one of those unluck, unlucky uh, military people who was forced to march in a march to uh, Manila Philippines, all later called the Bataan Death March. Uh, that was a 66 mile march and no food, no water, and if you fell down, couldn't get up, you were shot. So mm -hmm. quite an incentive to keep going. Uh, he later died in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, one of the worst camps there was. Uh, I have all the information supplied to me by Department of Defense. And so it's a story I had heard about, but it wasn't personal mm -hmm. until 2018. I got a letter from the Department of Defense stating that 
They believe they had recovered his remains in a mass grave and uh, they might require my DNA for identification. And then later on, I got another letter stating they would like my DNA. And if they identify his remains, I'll be contacted. If they do not identify his remains, I will not hear anything. So my hope and prayer is that they will identify his remains and they can be sent back home. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you think you said you were fourth generation? Right. Back so three. then my father would be the, the third one who was uh, in the Marine Corps mm -hmm. during Korea. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I enlisted in the Navy. And so that's the fourth generation. All right. So now we kind of wind our way back to you. So you're, you're born in 51. Uh, so you're, you're in high school when Vietnam is going yes. on. <coughs> uh, and were you paying attention to that at the time? I was. Watching the nightly news, uh, watching the war you know, being waged, and uh, it just looked like a very nasty war, a lot of American deaths. Um, my brother and I kind of looked at each other one night, I think we were juniors in high school, and said, you know what, this war is not going to be over when we graduate, and the draft was going on, and uh, we kind of looked at each other and said, you know what, we're going to have to do something. We're probably going to have to enlist, or we're going to be drafted. All right. Uh, now, had you, did you have plans to go to college at that point? I uh, had talked about college, but didn't know what I wanted to do. And kind of said, you know, we've got four choices here. We could go to college and hope for deferment. We could enlist in one of the branches. We could wait to be drafted. Or we could take off and go to Canada. Mm -hmm. Those were like the four choices. And this was in the late 60s. So a friend of mine who was in the Navy, in the aviation, said, you really ought to enlist in the Navy and choose to go aviation. So that's what we did. All right. So when did you actually uh, sign up initially? Signed up in October of 1969, and I graduated in 69. Okay. And then went active four months later, February of 70. All right. Now, when you enlisted, um, th were there hurdles you had to jump through? Because I think enlisting in the Navy might have been a popular option at that time for people who didn't want to be in the Army or the Marines. Well, we had to go for a, a physical in Detroit, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted to make sure that you were physically fit and uh, that you could uh, uh, get through boot camp and maybe into some uh, stressful times. Okay. Now, when you enlisted, were you able to request certain kinds of training or anything like that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I asked to be an aviation jet mechanic, mm -hmm. and uh, they decided that they had enough jet mechanics and I would become an aviation electrician. Okay. All right. Uh, now, were you sign how, and how long a hitch were you signing up for? Four years. Okay. Now, was that something that, I mean, was that the only option you had in the Navy at that time, or was there a three-year <coughs> version? Or? At that time, there was not. There was something before that called a kiddie cruise, which was a three-year Mm -hmm. But this was four years active, two years inactive reserve. Okay. All right. Uh, and so now, uh, so, so when do you start training then? Uh, boot camp in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois for, I think it was 12 weeks. Okay. And came home on a week's leave and then got sent to Jacksonville, Florida for aviation electric, electrician school. Okay. So when does the boot camp start? February of 70. All right. And so what did the boot camp consist of at that point? Uh, a lot of swimming. Uh, and if you could not swim, you could not graduate from boot camp. Um, so swimming, exercise, drilling, um, a lot of haircuts. If our, somebody in the camp, in our boot camp screwed up, we all went for haircuts. It was like a little <laughs> bit of a punishment. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, and how much emphasis was there on the spit and polish stuff? Uh, there was quite a bit, yeah. We had to stand a lot of inspections. Uh, and, uh, but we spent a lot of time waiting in what we called the chow line. Uh, sometimes we wait up to two hours for a meal outside waiting to get into the mess hall. And in February in Chicago, it was very, very, very cold. And looking back on it, going to Great Lakes in the wintertime, not a good decision. All right. Uh, and now, as you go on over the course of that 12 weeks, do you ever get to go off the base? 
one time, yes, we got to go off on what they call a liberty. It was a, it was a one night deal. You had to be back by midnight. And uh, so downtown Waukegan and uh, walked around, went to a few bars and one of those things. So. Okay, so you only get as far as Waukegan, you don't go into the city. That's right. Like that. Yeah, because I guess North Chicago is fairly far north of Chicago. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so then um, let's go on then to your advanced training. Talk about that. Okay, yeah, uh, aviation electrician training in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, that was a six month. I think it was, uh, I think I started in April and finished in October. And uh, we, uh, our barracks were World War II barracks, no air conditioning, and Florida in the summertime is pretty hot. Mm -hmm. But um, I survived and, and went through a pretty rigorous training school, learning all about uh, electricity and electronics and uh, trying to prepare me to become an uh, aviation electrician in the field working on any particular airplane. Okay. Did you have any kind of practical knowledge of things mechanical before that? I had a pretty good uh, you know, practical knowledge of uh, mechanicals and some electric, but n no formal training. Mm -hmm. I don't know, did you ever work on cars or just... Yes, you know, yeah, my father had a uh, gas station, worked on automobiles, so I knew some of the basics. So. Okay. All right. And what was life, I mean, aside from being hot, what was life like in Jacksonville? It was, uh, it was uh, a lot different than boot camp. We had a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of freedom. Once we were done with our day of training, we were welcome to go off base or do whatever we need to do, off for the weekends and travel down to Daytona and Cocoa Beach and, um, you know, a lot of weekend trips, but we had to be back uh, Monday morning for class, so. Okay, well, and you're in the South at this point in a period when desegregation has sort of officially happened, but in I mean, some of the resort areas, it might not have been a big deal. Jacksonville itself might have been different. I don't know. Did, were there any racial issues or tensions that you noticed either in the community or among the troops? No, uh, pretty accepting. Uh, we, uh, there really wasn't, I didn't feel the segregation in mm -hmm. the Jacksonville area. Maybe if I'd been in Mississippi or one of the other southern states, mm -hmm. I would have noticed that. But uh, it seemed to be, as far as I was concerned, there wasn't a uh, problem with that. Okay. And were there um, many black trainees in doing electricians training? A few, yes. Uh, and in boot camp, it was the first time I really had contact with African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Forest Hills High School, and we had one uh, black person in that class. And so in boot camp, uh, I learned a whole lot about a different race than mm -hmm. I had known. All right. Okay. So you get through your, your six months now uh, mechanics training, and now what happens to you? Okay. This is where you put in your dream sheet, as it's called. Where do you want to go? Uh, you had to list some stateside places, some overseas places, and then it's up to the Navy where you go. And uh, so a friend of mine that we were in electrician school with said, put in for Patuxent River, Maryland. That's close to my home, and we'll have a lot of fun on weekends. And so my twin brother and I put in for brother duty and for Patuxent River, Maryland, I think was the other overseas was Germany, and we listed some other places. Sure enough, we got assigned Patuxent River, Maryland, and he got, our friend got sent to San Diego, California. So <laughs> that's right. the luck of the draw. Okay. So you, your brother was with you yes. through all of this? Yes, boot camp, aviation electrician training in Jacksonville, and then we got orders to uh, Pax River, Maryland. Okay, now you're, Identical twin brothers with the same haircut. Did you ever take advantage of that? We did. We did. I knew his service number and he knew my service number. And we would have to stand four hour watches, whatever base we were at. And uh, <clears throat> if he wanted to go someplace, I would take his watch and he'd take mine. Uh, they couldn't tell us apart and they weren't going to check fingerprints, but as long as I knew his. His serial number and I, he knew mine. We got away with uh, 
of that a lot. Okay, did anybody ever get suspicious? No, they didn't. So, so no one ever actually asked you for your, your, your serial number? No. <laughs> okay. No. I guess as long as the job was getting done. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was getting done. So the government was not getting shortchanged. All right. Uh, and so now what were you actually doing at the Tuxent River when you're there? Uh, I was first in a, a training squadron. Uh, basically it was whatever they needed to do. It was standing watches, cleaning barracks, doing whatever the Navy needed done that really wasn't important, but it was getting us ready to when our squadron uh, needed us to, uh, to join them. Mm -hmm. okay. So how long did you have that job? It was just like three months. Okay. And uh, then uh, I got orders to, well, actually, I should, I w already had orders to Patrol Squadron 8. We shortened that to VP8, which stands for Fixed Wing Patrol Squadron 8. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I wasn't uh, sent to them until I believe it was in January of 1971. Okay. Uh, and when you get assigned to them, now what are you doing? All right. I'm assigned to what they call the electric shop. And you're assigned with other electricians. And this was in a P3 patrol squadron. Uh, it was a Lockheed four engine turbo turbo prop, prop plane and we had 12 planes in our squadron and so we were assigned to work on these planes either to change fuel pumps or generators or black boxes or occasionally an engine and uh, so these everything had to be done and then inspected and uh, before the planes could fly. Okay and how large a team or a crew would you work with when you're doing that? Uh, Usually one or two other electricians. Sometimes we were working side by side with an aviation jet mechanic if we were changing a fuel pump. We disconnected the wires, they pulled the pump, put the new pump in, and we rewired it. Okay. Uh, and what kind of activity did these patrol aircraft engage in? What were they doing? Primarily, uh, we tracked uh, Russian submarines in the Atlantic. That was our, our squadron's primary goal. And sometimes it was done uh, from Pax River, Maryland. Uh, later it was done from Brunswick, Maine. Other times it was done from overseas. We would go on detachments and we did a small group of planes or the whole squadron and fly patrols every day and uh, look for the Russian submarines. All right, now your job officially is, is ground crew. Exactly. Could you have basically stayed on the base the whole time? Except when we would go on deployment with the okay. whole squadron, okay. yes. All right. Uh, now, did you fly? Yes, but I, I, when I flew, was I would volunteer to fly as a maintenance electrician. If they were going to a foreign country I hadn't been to before, I would say, hey, if you need a maintenance electrician, I'll fly along, bring my toolbox, and usually they're granted that request. So I did, I, I flew quite a bit. Okay, so on a standard patrol mission then, they wouldn't have had an electrician, but if they were gonna land someplace else, they take one with them? Yes, yep, that, that's the case. Yep, if it was just strictly patrol, uh, no, they would, didn't need me to go along. Okay, uh, when you do fly with them, I mean, what's it like physically just inside one of these planes? It's a big propeller plane. Yeah, there's uh, uh, three seats in the front. That's a pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer. And back from that is the, uh, the radio man. And then there's a big electronics bay. And behind that, there's some more seats and a galley. And mm -hmm. I was usually was either sitting in the galley or one of the seats in the back. And could you look outside from there? Or were you uh, yeah, we, we, we could look outside. And uh, so basically when the plane was flying, I was just uh, just along for the ride and mm -hmm. usually couldn't fix anything while the plane was in flight. All right. Okay. So where did you wind up going? Uh, every year our squadron would, de would deploy to Bermuda. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was usually in uh, January, February we'd go to Bermuda and then uh, went on a mini detachment to Puerto Rico for two months and did a lot of snorkeling and swimming and traveling around the island. 
and flew into Panama, and then quite often to Rota, Spain, and to Mildenhall, England. Uh, flew one flight to Norholtz, Germany, and to Iceland several times, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and also to Lodges Field in the Azores, which is an island in the middle of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so probably a few other places I flew into, but those are the places that come to mind. All right. Uh, and are there particular incidents or recollections of some of these places that stand out for you? Yes. In, uh, I was in Puerto Rico, and uh, the uh, officers decided they wanted to fly to Panama to buy some stereo equipment. You could buy it duty-free uh, in Panama. So I wanted some stereo equipment, so I said, I'd love to go on this flight. They said, okay. So we took off from Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, lost a generator shortly after takeoff. And they said, this isn't good. So they landed in Ramey Air Force Base at the other end of the island. And could I fix this? Mm -hmm. And I was told that from other electricians, if I could take the generator off the APU, which is the auxiliary power unit, swap that with bad generator, as long as it was ground power, uh, the, the plane could fly again. So the generator weighed 90 pounds, but I knew how to change them. Swap mm -hmm. this generator out and uh, took off for Panama. Otherwise, we would have had to return to uh, Roosevelt Road. So mm -hmm. I fixed the plane so the officers and myself, we could buy some stereo equipment. All right. Uh, and did you manage to get the equipment? Yes, I did. Yes, yes. Okay. And that was quite the deal. We had, uh, they told me, go in to these stereo places and haggle with the owner, and they're used to it, and you'll get them down to the bottom dollar, and then you walk out. So. All right. Um, you know, what was Road of Spain like? Uh, we, Road of Spain was, uh, the base itself was, was nice, but actually we actually flew in the, to Terre Haute Air Force Base in Madrid. That was actually nicer than Rota. Rota, of course, was on the, on the coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would take a taxi off base and tour Madrid, Spain, and bought a lot of trinkets over there. Okay. Now, Madrid's right in the middle of the country, so how do you yes. get from Madrid down to Rota? With our, our plane, okay, we so take off from Rota and fl okay. fly into the Air Force Base. And All right. All right. Uh, do you have any idea why you would fly into Madrid first? I mean, uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, it was just uh, how things were done back then. They okay. would always fly into Rota first and then on to Madrid. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, okay. So you went to Rota first, then Madrid. Yes. I thought was yeah. where, okay. But if Madrid is what you were actually flying out of or that was where you were based. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, how generally did people in these different countries treat you? Generally uh, treated pretty well. And this is before terrorism really mm -hmm. took root. Uh, it's not something we were concerned with. I remember seeing in Spain, I remember seeing the gate guards with machine guns, and that was kind of an eye opener. But, you know, there was some hostility in, in that part of the world back then. So, uh, but treated pretty well. Uh, there were times when we were told not to wear our military uniforms. Uh, they would tell us ahead of time mm -hmm. and uh, to wear your civilian clothes if you went off base. Okay. Uh, of course, you're spending most of your time back in, in the United States. Yes. And this is still sort of latter part of the Vietnam era when the anti-war movement is, is fairly intense right. for a while. Uh, how much did that uh, affect you or how much of that did you see? Well, when I joined my squadron, uh, I asked about if they were going to Vietnam. And they had been there in 1969. And when I joined, they said they were not scheduled to go back, so I felt kind of fortunate. Mm -hmm. But we occasionally would get people that had come from Vietnam would join our squadron and hear about their tales. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the anti-war movement or stuff, was any of that ever directed toward you or people in your base? It was when I flew home. Uh, I, would, I started wearing my dress blues when I would fly home on a commercial airline. And that's when I was called a baby killer. I was spit at. I was called some names I can't repeat on this interview. Mm -hmm. And all because uh, there was certain, uh, certain uh, 
few Americans that hated the war, so military represented Vietnam, so uh, let's pick on this, this mm -hmm. sailor. Yeah, it, it's something that still looks kind of strange in, in retrospect, but that was a lot of the hostility and the anger got directed toward yes. the ordinary servicemen. So I stopped wearing my uniform. I wore civilian clothes, and then I wasn't bothered. Mm -hmm. It's not that I wasn't proud of the uniform. I just didn't want to put up with harassment. All right. Um, and what was sort of daily life like for you on the base while you were there? Uh, really had it pretty good. It was like going to a job. You'd go in in the morning and work on airplanes and uh, lunch at the mess hall and go home after after uh, a day of working. And uh, I lived off base after a while with uh, my brother and some other guys from my squadron. And eventually I got married when I'm, uh, six months before I got out of the Navy. Mm -hmm. And so left off base. So military was like going to a job. All right. Now, during the time that you were in, were there any uh, alerts or times when it looked like something more serious might be happening or any disruptions to that routine? Uh, uh, there was one time where we flew to Puerto Rico uh, for um, a, uh, a war exercise and Russian ships and some subs had kind of made a, their presence known and uh, uh, that was, we were on high alert back then thinking there might be something, but it didn't materialize. Okay. Now, one thing that does go on in this period is that there's the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. Yes. Um, did that have any ripple effects for you? It had no effect. We knew about it, but it had no effect on our squadron. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and at a certain point, your squadron goes from Maryland up to Maine. How yes. far into your tour was that? That was in uh, uh, later of uh, the latter part of 72. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we were told we were going to go to to Brunswick, Maine, to to change our home port there. And uh, that was a really nice base. Uh, the people from Maine were friendly to the sailors, and uh, it was uh, I enjoyed going and getting seafood and lobster. It mm -hmm. was uh, it was a fun place. And I lived off base in Freeport, Maine, which was where L. L. Bean mm -hmm. is, and we were a block away from the store. And uh, so it was, yeah, it was good, good duty. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, did you have any sense of why you moved up there? Uh, they needed uh, another squadron in that area uh, to be home base there. Patuxent River, Maryland was a test center, and they were doing more testing with jets and fighters. And patrol squadron was, we, I kind of felt like we might have been in the way. <laughs> All right. Now, was there much else going on at the base in Brunswick, or were you pretty much it? Well, we had other squadrons there, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, there was only patrol squadrons. We didn't have any any fighter jets. Occasionally, one would land, but uh, mostly just patrol squadrons. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it was it was a naval air station as opposed to a base with ships or things yes, like that. Yes, yeah, there. just naval air station. Yes. All right. Uh, now, uh, as you're there, I guess it's another kind of thing. What kind of people did you have uh, giving you orders? I mean, who were you answering to and what were they like? I was answering to a chief petty officer. We called him chief mm -hmm. and he was in charge of electric shop. And then of course we had officers in our squadron. And uh, so basically I was taking, uh, taking orders from chief. He would say, okay, tomorrow you're taking off for Keflavik, Iceland. We need to send a couple of planes up there and you're going. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, but then we had officers in our squadron, of course, I was enlisted. So if you met an officer, you had a salute and he returned the salute. Mm -hmm. So most of your dealings really would have been just with the chief. Exactly. That yes. Kind of thing. Now, did you have the same chief the whole time? No, we had, we had two different chiefs, uh, Chief Trout and Chief Carroll, and uh, respected both of them. They were... Uh, very quirky as far as the, the kind of people they were, both very different, but I respected them and they respected the work I did. Okay, so did the group kind of get along pretty well? Yeah, by and large. Occasionally there was a few arguments, but uh, that's kind of how things go in the military. Mm -hmm. Okay, well how would you characterize morale in your unit? 
Well, it was good, yes. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we were getting ready to go on a, a deployment. Uh, it was always the, all the last minute stuff. The, the, the guys didn't want to leave their girlfriends and girlfriends didn't want to see their boyfriends leave and, and husbands and wives were, mm -hmm. I hate to see you go because I don't know when you're going to come back and that type of thing. All right. Now, did you give any thought to reenlisting? I did. Uh, in 1974, I was offered $10,000 if I would uh, re-enlist for another six years. Mm -hmm. $10,000 in 1974 was a lot of money. But I'd had good duty. Uh, I was married, and I wanted to, I said, you know what? I've done my time. I want to get out. I want to head back home. Mm -hmm. All right, because 1974 wasn't the best of times economically necessarily. No, gas was kind of high. I mean, it was probably 50 cents a gallon back then. And yeah. Did you have employment prospects, or did you uh, know what you could my do? I, my father had sold his business, so I really didn't have, I uh, wasn't heading back to a job, but felt that I, I would be able to find employment, and I wasn't worried about it. All right. Uh, now, are there other particular things that, that happened to you or you saw while you were in the Navy that you want to bring into the story here? Sure. Uh, a, kind of a funny story. We were stationed in uh, Bermuda, and my brother and I would go to the Protestant service, church service, on Sunday and met the Admiral, Admiral Rich, and his wife. And kind of, they kind of befriended us. We were enlisted, and of course, mm -hmm. he was an Admiral. I mean... And so they would talk to us every Sunday. Well, it was one Christmas, I believe it was in Christmas of 72, and said, uh, are you boys going home for, for Christmas? No, we don't have leave, so we're going to be here. How would you like to come to our home on Christmas Day for dinner? This is that Admiral's house, mm -hmm. off base. Mm -hmm. well, that would be great. And so my brother and I went uh, to Christmas dinner and uh, got treated like royalty. Uh, they had a, a pit on a, I guess they had a pig that was being roasted on a spit and just all some really great food. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the uh, Admiral's daughter was a, uh, an aide to a senator and she was very attractive. So, <laughs> uh, you know, being a single guy, it was a fun day. But the funny story is just before we went to this dinner, one of the officers in my squadron said, hey, what gives? How come you guys are invited to the Admiral's house for Christmas dinner and I didn't get invited? I said, well, we go to church. And they met us at church. And maybe if you had been at the church service, you may have been invited. So <laughs> it was kind of a gotcha moment. Yeah, I guess so. And that's where adding the second part was like, we, we knew him from church. It's yeah, probably that's right. where you stop at yeah, that point. That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, other, other things like that that you want to bring in here? Uh, yeah, Iceland. Uh, I think it was my second flight to Iceland. Um, we were flying in a thunderstorm, and this was in the fall. I think it was October. And a uh, pretty nasty storm. And the closer we got to Iceland, the worse the weather got. And uh, our pilot was, his first name was John, one, probably one of the best pilots in our squadron. And uh, he could land in anything. Well, we tried to make the first landing, could not see the runway. Pulled up, second time came in, could not see the runway. And so I'm not really too worried until he announces on the intercom, how many parachutes do we have in the plane? Do we have enough parachutes for everybody on board? We quickly counted the parachutes, and yes, we did have enough. And he goes, I have enough fuel for a third pass, possibly a fourth, but the P-3 did not have a good record of ditching in the ocean. Uh, survival was not good. Mm -hmm. Far better survival would have been to jump out of the plane with a parachute. But fortunately, on the third pass, he could see enough of the runway, and we touched down, so no problem. So mm -hmm. looking at that point, I remember my heart was beating pretty, pretty hard, thinking, 
you know, are we going to crash or am I going to have to jump with a parachute? And uh, how's this all going to turn out? But uh, it turned out all right. all right. What was Guantanamo like? Guantanamo, uh, and we called that Gitmo. That was at one end of the island and of Cuba, which we do have a naval air station there. And of course, the, the uh, prison uh, is there now for the uh, terrorists. Mm -hmm. um, that was a kind of a, a neat place to go. Um, I was there for a week and uh, did some snorkeling. The, the Cuban uh, water is probably the warmest and most beautiful uh, snorkeling that I ever did. So I was down there for a week on a special mission and then flew back to the States. All right. And did you uh, have any sense that you, you, you got the Cubans out there on the other side of the wire looking at you? Or? Well, we were told, don't go near the fence, stay back from the fence. And uh, uh, it, was, it was one of those things we realized that the enemy was just on the other side. And as long as we stayed on our base and stayed away from the fence, we were safe. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so when do you actually get out? Get out of February of 1974. Okay. And did you come back to the Grand Rapids area at that point? Yes, yeah. The military paid to have my belongings uh, packed up and sent back. Uh, and uh, so came back and, uh, yeah. What kind of work did you go into? Went to work for a company called Lear Siegler. They made uh, flight attitude indicators uh, for, uh, for airplanes. In mm -hmm. fact, the same flight attitude indicator that I had changed while in the Navy, I actually worked on mm -hmm. at Lear Siegler. And I said, this is great. This is going to be a great job. I know what I'm working on here and have knowledge of it. But mm -hmm. these were uh, uh, orders that the military had ordered before the Vietnam ended. Mm -hmm. And so these uh, orders kind of dried up. So consequently, uh, Lear Siegler's uh, business had kind of fallen off when the war ended. All right, and did you lose the job at that I point? I did, I got laid off twice and right. decided that, uh, you know what, uh, being in the union and working for a company that doesn't have enough orders is not what I want to do. Okay, so what you wind up doing after that? Went to work for a, a company making industrial paints and powder coating. And my father knew the owner and I knew the owner and uh, uh, worked my way up to become plant manager and uh, had a good job. All right. Uh, now, today, you're uh, active with sort of veterans issues or affairs exactly. of different yes. kinds. What sorts of things are you doing? Well, I'm in the American Legion. I'm connected with the Middleville uh, Post, and uh, I'm one of, the, one of the members there. As we have just probably 15 members, kind of a small group, but... Uh, I'm involved in the uh, Middleville uh, Memorial Day Parade. Uh, I was voted Veteran of the Year in 2019 and uh, also work, work with the 9-11 uh, the ceremony they have. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in a lot of parades uh, and uh, just volunteer to speak as a military veteran and talk about the freedoms that every American enjoys, but somebody had to pay for that freedom and mm -hmm. just try and uh, be a good representative for the military. Right. And then you were involved uh, with something back at your original high school, weren't you? Yes. Uh, Forest Hills Central, there was only one when I went to school, only one Forest Hills High School, and uh, they had a, uh, call a veterans wall and it was kind of a dream of a couple of teachers and they put up this wall of five different branches of the military. Each uh, uh, person in the military was represented by a dog tag with their name and the year they graduated. And they also had an active wall where uh, they showed the five killed in action uh, graduates from Forest Hills, mm -hmm. and there's an, a wall that I have not completed. Uh, I can enter the information from my military service uh, in this interactive wall. Mm -hmm. All right. So as you look back at the time that you spent in the service, I mean, how do you think that affected you, or what did you take out of it? I think it really helped mature me. 
Um, I felt like I was quite immature when I joined the, the Navy. Uh, I, military taught me discipline, uh, being punctual, following orders, respect, um, all things that, uh, that I was taught through my military experiences. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much then for coming in and sharing a story today. You're welcome. Thank right. you, James. That's